I've chosen three groups of organisms to highlight at the end of our kind of survey of history of life on Earth. And I've chosen these because, one, they're important for our modern world and the diversity of it. Two, there's a pretty good fossil record and uh, with new finds that are very recent and ongoing finds. And three, they just kind of capture the imagination of people. So um, whales, which we'll do to, in this lecture. The next one is birds, and we'll talk about the origin and evolution of birds. And then finally, horses. So let's look at whales. Now, when I say whales, I mean the group Cetacea, which actually includes whales and dolphins. So dolphins and whales are all part of the whale group. The technical name is Cetacea. Or as you see it here, um, they've got Cetacea morpha, which includes some extinct things. And we're going to be talking about those extinct things. But we're looking at um, the cetaceans, or the whales and dolphins. Okay? For a long time, although whales have been, long, been widely recognized as mammals, we didn't know what their closest relative was. They're very obviously mammals, although quite unique and derived. But we didn't know what they were closely related to. And this is because they are so uniquely evolved and suited for their aquatic environment. Now, recently, through both fossil evidence and even more importantly, through analysis of genetic data looking at relationships, it's been well established that the closest relative of the whales and their extinct ancestors is the hippopotamus. So whales belong to a group of organisms uh, commonly called the ruminants, or if we want to be uh, very uh, technical, Arteriodactyla. And Arteriodactyla include hippos, pigs, camels, um, the gazelles. Um, and so it's a fairly large group of grazing um, ruminants. Giraffes are part of that. Um, Anyway, it's, a, it's just a, it's a big group. And of course, whales are a little bit distinct and unique. Not only are they adapted to an aquatic environment, but they are also carnivores, which is unusual because most members of the groups are orbiv herbivorous or like the pig, they're omnivores. So whales not only evolved as an aquatic group, but even earlier before they were aquatic or at least fully aquatic, they became carnivores, uh, evolved to become carnivores, even though the ancestors of, of them, of that entire group, were herbivores. Okay, so just keep that in mind. The, the closest living relatives of, of whales are hippopotamus. Okay, now, let's look at some of the extinct relatives. So these are included in this larger group, um, as we've got marked here, right, Cetacea morpha. But we'll just call them the extinct relatives of, of, of modern whales. The earliest one that we have dates back to 50 million years ago. And this is a very small, well, compared to whales at least. So there's a little old flip phone there if that helps give you reference. So this is cat-sized or small dog-sized. Uh, uh, and it, you look at it and immediately it does not scream whale, right? It doesn't look like a whale at all. And this is because whales have changed so much. They've evolved. But how do we know then that this is a close relative that belongs to that group leading up to the whales? Well, the key to this are the inner ear bones. Now, all mammals have three ear bones, right? You learn this if you take an A&P, maybe even in other classes, right? The hammer, the anvil, and the stirrups, or the incus, the malleus, and the stapes. Those are the um, Latin names for them. But... In whales, those three inner ear bones have a very distinct shape. And so this organism has that whale, distinct whale shape. And so it's actually technically not a whale inner ear bone. It's that group, the larger group that includes whales and their recently extinct ancestors. Okay, So that's the key for all of these. They have that distinct whale ear. Now later, we start to see other features that, that begin to link them, and we can see more of the transition. So for each of these relatives, I don't care that you memorize the date. You don't need to do that. You should, however, know the name. Okay, so Indohyus is an early ancestor of the whales. It looks something like a muskrat, and it was a carnivore and probably semi-aquatic, as, as shown in this diagram here. But you can see it's, it's still very equipped and adept for getting up on land. Could uh, spend time in, equally in both the land and the water. The next fossil record that we have leading to our modern whales is Pachycetus. Now, Pachycetus literally means the whale from Pakistan. That's where the fossils were found. 
And here's a diagram showing the most complete skeleton we have of this species. This is an artist's uh, rendition of what Pachycetus would have looked like. And again, you look at it, and it doesn't really look like a whale. It's evolved a little bit more for an aquatic life. Its ears have gotten smaller, eyes and nostril near the top of its head, so it can spend time underwater and still see and breathe above the water. Uh, it has webbed feet. It's a little hard to see on this. So it's becoming more adapted, but again, not really similar to what we see. This was maybe filling a niche similar to modern otters, um, maybe not quite as fast and as agile in the water as an otter, but an, a, a, a hunter of fish and living primarily in aquatic environments, although it could still get up onto land. The next fossil we're going to look at is Ambulocetus, and now we're beginning to see more whale-like characteristics. But again, that ear bone characteristic is the, the smoking gun, if you will, the giveaway. So notice, ears are smaller, eyes and nose, again, very much near the top of its head, much uh, more adapted to water, but still swimming with its legs and using its tail just for balance um, or for maybe a little bit of helping change its direction, but a very uh, active predator. And this is filling a niche that's similar to, to crocodiles and alligators, maybe, maybe a little bit like a seal, you know, but a predator looking for fish, looking for other things in the water and a very active hunter. Ambulo means walking. So this is literally, again, again, the walking whale. And we have nearly complete skeletons, but there are other um, samples also. So this is 45 million years ago. Again, don't memorize the dates, but you should know kind of the general progression. Two other important fossils we're going to mention. Dorudon. Now we're seeing the, the dramatic increase in size, although that's a general trend across all of these fossils. They tend to be bigger and bigger the more recent they are. Dorudon is now very obviously a whale, although with primitive features. Notice that its blowhole is not completely moved up to the position where it is in modern whales, but it's no longer at the end of its nostril, so it's moved uh, to a posterior position on the top of the head. Um, teeth peg-like for hunting fish, uh, now much more like modern whales, whereas we, we start to see a little bit of that with back in Ambulocetus, but still some tooth differentiation with some kind of sawing and cutting teeth in the back and then the peg-like teeth in the front. Now we're getting, sorry, Endorodon, much more peg-like teeth all the way around. But notice the one other major difference here, it does now have the distinctive flukes and is using its tail for propulsion rather than its limbs, but it still has hind limbs, which modern whales do not have any external remnant. There's still a small anatomical internal remnant, but they don't have external uh, hind legs, but Dorodon did. And then finally, Basilosaurus. Basilosaurus is the last of the fossils we're going to look at. 38 million years ago was the dominant predator. These were large, the size of killer whales, um, or even small, um, baleen whales, which are the modern filter feeding whales. It looks much more whale-like, but still has very primitive features, right? But it's got the dorsal fin of modern whales. It has the flukes. It has hind limbs still, but they're at this point pretty much completely vestigial, just a, a remnant. That's a good vocabulary word that we'll come back to. Vestigial means a remnant of a former structure that no longer performs a function. So it's kind of a reminder of an ancient history but no longer uh, does anything for the organism. So hind limbs and Bacillosaurus were vestigial. You can see the remnants of the bone here in this diagram of what their skeleton would have looked like. And that's one meter, so three feet. So this, these guys were like 30, 40 feet long, okay? Um, so large, active predators. And just a quick word, we'll come back to this when we talk about birds. But mammals, after the Cretaceous extinction, which knocked out many of the dinosaurs, knocked out the pterosaurs, knocked out the plesiosaurs, the ichthyosaurs. There are all these open ecological spaces that are available for the survivors of that extinction. And so mammals in general, and this whale example is, is a good example of that, benefited from that open ecological space. They no longer have the competition they, they would have faced prior to the extinction, in this case, of the ichthyosaurs and the plesiosaurs. And so whales evolve and begin to fill those big dominant predator niches that previously had been filled by um, plesiosaurs, ichthyosaurs. There's still some competition, right? Sharks survived, alligators and crocodiles survived, but those are primarily freshwater with just a little bit of saltwater uh, habitat. And so whales evolved to fill up those niches that had been vacated by those large extinct diapsids.
Modern whales are quite diverse. And again, whales and dolphins, we're including both in that. Now, many whales and, and dolphins, including the killer whale, bottlenose dolphins, and some that you're probably not as familiar with, still have the more ancestral feature of peg teeth. They're fish or mammal or, um, in, in some rare cases, other prey, but they're active hunters of these, of these prey, and they have these peg-like teeth, and, and they serve them very well for grabbing prey and, and holding on to it till they can break it apart and swallow it in big chunks. However, the biggest whales, which are the largest known animals ever to live, right? So the blue whale is the largest animal. It's even larger size-wise than any of the big marine diapsids or any of the uh, big, biggest dinosaurs. Uh, the reason that they were able to evolve to this enlarged size is because of modifications to the mouth part. They have what is called baleen, which is essentially a feather-like or net-like structure that allows them to filter the large gulps of water and krill, small plankton, that they take in. And so they're still predators, but their prey is much, much smaller, and they're able to filter it out and therefore harvest vast amounts of this plankton. And so they have very, very modified teeth, but the ancestral form is still present in most whales. Most of the species, if you look at them, are what we call the toothed whales or the beaked whales, right? which are the dolphins, the orcas, the pilot whales, and those sorts of things. Okay, um, this image kind of cuts it off, but the uh, largest of the toothed whales is the um, a sperm whale, which like kind of like Moby Dick, right? But these large predators that hunt go down deep to the bottom and hunt squid, but they have these teeth, these peg teeth for grabbing and hanging onto it. So that's the ancestral form. So just be a little bit familiar with that. Know that the baleen whales and the main thing that's allowed them to get so incredibly large. It, uh, that distinguishes them from the other whales are their feeding methods and the modified mouth parts they have for those feeding methods.